So uh, I will start then to introduce you. Uh, boa noite a todos. Nós vamos iniciar o nosso nosso conferencista, provavelmente o, o mais famoso dos cirurgiões de coluna do mundo. Uh, e quando a gente fala de cirurgião de coluna, uh, o cirurgião de deformidade é assim, mais ou menos como o neurocirurgião pensa que ele é, mais próximo de Deus, né? Um, e uh, o, o Larry Lenk é meu amigo já há algum tempo, uh, eu sei que ele se formou em Chicago, na Northwestern, fez a residência e ficou no Washu, em St. Louis, onde ele treinou muita gente, muita gente do Brasil também, passou por lá. Uh, eu tive a oportunidade recente de... Ele, ele recentemente se mudou para Nova York, eu tenho a impressão que deve fazer alguma coisa de como cinco anos, ele agora é o chefe da Columbia University e é o chefe do Hospital de Coluna do Presbiterian. Uh, então, ele, ele já galgou todos os, 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 os steps uh, que uh, um cirurgião pode alcançar e, e é uma honra ter uh, o Larry Lenk aqui com a gente. Ele vai falar sobre uma nova classificação de escoliose. Eu espero que o... Eu só estou aqui para introduzi-lo, ele é meu amigo, mas fora isso... O assunto é bem estranho às minhas, aos meus conhecimentos. Então, eu espero que Defino modere aí. Tudo bem, Defino? Tudo ok, Pimenta, tudo ok. Uh, yes, uh, you can start, Larry. Thank you for coming again, and it's a great, great pleasure to have you. Right. Thank you, Luiz, appreciate that. Hopefully, I can share my screen. Let's see. All right. Can you all see this now? Are, you, are we good? Yeah. Great. Very good. Thank you, Louise. I appreciate the introduction. Um, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time this evening introducing a new classification system, uh, which is, as you'll see, treatment-based for adult idiopathic scoliosis, or ADIS. Um, uh, which, as you'll see, there'll be some reference to the AIS system that has now been uh, in, um, in presence and use for over almost 20 years. So you'll see we're kind of using that as a, as a somewhat of a foundation. My disclosures, as most people may know, I do have a substantial royalty agreement with Medtronic for some of the uh, uh, implants and IP that I have in the systems that you'll see here. Uh, as we all know, um, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis ultimately evolves if it's untreated into adult idiopathic scoliosis. So here on the left is a younger AIS patient with a double major curve that basically 30 or 40 years later, this is what it can look like, uh, an older adult with ADIS. But it's basically the same pathology, just often with progression and degenerative changes that occur. So when considering a new radiographic classification system of ADIS, we wanted to still make it uh, radiographic and two-dimensional. Still, It's still our main means of communication, even though we know Scoliosis is three-dimensional. We're still communicating two-dimensionally uh, as far as uh, uh, our, our, our uh, in, uh, communication goes between, between our uh, surgeons. We honestly make it simple, uh, reliable, and we like the idea of making it modular, similar to the AIS system, because it's easier to remember. And also we can add components to the future. You know, ADIS is more complicated. As you'll see, we have not included MRI findings yet, clinical symptoms. You know, there's a host of other things we can add in the future, uh, but because it's modular, we can do that. So it's always nice to have a modular system. We wanted to take the familiarity of the AS system and use it in the ADIS system, as you'll see. So we leverage the components of the AIS, some of the AIS system in there, um, uh, as you'll see in here. So here's the AIS system that I, I was very proud to be uh, developed with parts of the Harms study group, including Randy Betts and Jurgen Harms, Keith Bidwell, people you all know that uh, again, published in 2001, is still uh, unbelievably the gold standard around the world for AIS uh, classification. Just to, uh, uh, as a the briefing, uh, this has three components, a curve type, a lumbar spine modifier, and a sagittal thoracic modifier. Then we take one of those, each component and put it together for their complete curve classification. 
Now, when we do the AIS system and AIS evaluation, we really look at the three regions of the spine that can develop curvature, the proximal thoracic, the main thoracic, and the thoracolumbar and lumbar we lump together. Those are really three main reasons. And obviously we take those three regions and that's how we develop the curve type. The difference in ADIS is we need to pay attention to the lumbosacral fractional curve because that often can develop degenerative changes, subluxation, stenosis, and, uh, and stiffness that will uh, require us to render treatment to that area. So that's gonna become an important component to our ADIS classification system. So here now is the three components to ADIS. Number one is the curve type. And you'll see we use the same exact curve types as the AIS system because the curves are the same. They may be larger, they may be stiffer, but they're, they're the same six curve types, whether you're 18 years old or 78 years old. The difference is you'll see is we're gonna define the minor curve structural criteria on a supine x-ray, supine AP x-ray, not side benders. I do not do side bending x-rays on adults anymore. I'll tell you why and we'll show you how we use a single supine x-ray to develop structural criteria. The second component uh, and the first modifier is a lumbosacral modifier. As I, as I mentioned, the L4 to sacrum region is extremely important to evaluate in the adult idiopathic patient. And we're gonna use the supine x-ray and, and cri radiographic criteria to de de determine whether the lumbosacral modifier is either non-structural or structural. The implication being the non-structural modifier, we'd re we'd not, we prefer not to fuse the lumbosacral region, try and stop our fusion at L4 if we can or L3. And the structural lumbosacral modifier, most of the time we're gonna to have to consider including that in the instrumentation of fusion. The next modifier and the third component is a global balance modifier, certainly in children, but even more importantly in adults, we know the importance of keeping them well balanced in the coronal and sagittal planes. That trumps any type of regional alignment. So on the standing AP and lateral trays, we basically have criteria of greater than equal to four centimeters of sagittal balance or greater than equal to four centimeters of coronal balance to lead to an imbalanced modifier. So uh, as you'll see, we have four components to that. So here's the three types. We'll go into each of these. So the curve type one through six, these are exactly the same curve types as you see on the far right that we have for AIS system. We have type one main thoracic, type two double thoracic, type three double major, and so on, because they're the same curves. They may be larger, stiffer, but they're the same. But for the structural criteria to determine the minor curve structural criteria, we do not use side benders. We use a single supine x-ray. If the residual Cobb measurement is greater than or equal to 35 degrees, or we have, again, similar to AIS kyphosis, um, T2 to T5 or greater than or equal to 20 degrees, or thoracolumbar kyphosis greater than 20 degrees, that renders that uh, minor curve as a structural curve. Uh, so again, we're just replacing the side bending 25 degree criteria with the supine 35 degree criteria for structurality. So here's an example, very straightforward, uh, right thoracic curve in a 30 year old lady. You see the main curve is main, uh, 55 degrees, it's main thoracic curve, that's the major curve. Uh, what about the um, curves above and below? On the supine image in the middle, the proximal thoracic curve is 22 degrees, that's non-structural, and the lumbar curve below is 18 degrees is non-structural. So obviously that's a type one main thoracic curve, pretty straightforward. A little more complicated is this curve. Uh, as older adult, again, the major curve is still in the main thoracic region measuring 72 degrees. The far left x-ray is the upright x-ray, obviously. Now in the middle x-ray, the supine x-ray, the proximal thoracic curve on supine imaging is 36 degrees. So that's structural by our criteria, as well as the lumbar curve below at 56 degrees is structural uh, as well. So this is a type four triple major curve. Yeah, very similar to what we'd see in adolescents. Obviously the key here then is what about the lumbosacral fractional curve? And we'll talk about that for uh, structurality is next. So again, the lumbosacral modifier is either designated as non-structural NS or structural, again, based on the supine AP image and the L4 to sacrum Cobb measurement. And we basically use 20 degrees as the cutoff. So if that L4 to sacrum measurement is less than 20 degrees on the far left, it's a non-structural lumbosacral modifier. If it's greater than 24 degrees, it's a structural modifier, as you see on the far right. Now, how do we come up with 20 degrees? Basically, it's a review of, of, of hundreds of cases that I've done and my colleagues have done. Uh, again, nothing's perfect. I'm not saying if something's 19 degrees, it's absolutely non-structural and you don't need to fuse it. I'm not saying if it's 21 degrees, even though we call it structural, you absolutely have to fuse it, but it's a very, very nice guideline. And basically over 90, 95% of the time, 
uh, when curves are uh, residual curves are well over 20 degrees, we're going to include that in the in the instrumentation infusion because that's just a structural part of the spine. Often with degeneration, sometimes with stenosis, obviously, but that uh, the, the 20 degree is a, is a nice reference. It's not perfect, but it's a nice reference. As for the second modifier, the global balance modifier, here again, we just basically look at C7 plumb line. C7 plumb line greater than four centimeters in the sagittal plane is a sagittal imbalance curve. And again, either four centimeters to left or right in the coronal plane is a coronal imbalance curve. So we have four types of, ba of uh, balance modifiers. BAL balance means that uh, the patient's balanced in the coronal and sagittal plane. You have a patient with isolated sagittal imbalance, SAG, isolated coronal imbalance, COR, or those with combined sagittal and coronal imbalance are COM combined. So you, you get one of these four depictions put on each patient. So let's kind of do a couple examples to put this together. So here's a you know, pretty straightforward um, uh, patient, 48 degree thoracal lumbar and lumbar curve on standing far left, the supine image, again, the uh, main, main thoracic proximal plastic curve above or non-structural, uh, the lumbar cycle curve on residual uh, 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 supine image is 22 degrees, so that's structural. So the classification is type five, thoracal lumbar, structural balance, the patient's balance in the coronal and sagittal plane. So 5S balanced is the classification. And we'll go through some of the, some more cases to kind of highlight that. Uh, as part of a submission of spine deformity that we're waiting for final publication, we've had two or three revisions and we're very close to getting this uh, accepted. Uh, we had 12 surgeons looked at three, uh, 30 pre-marked x-rays twice one week apart to look at inter and intra-observer reliability. And basically we found for inter-observer reliability that we have pretty good kappa values, 0.729 with a curve type, 0.955 lumbar cycle modifier, and 0 0.1919 for global balance modifiers. Those are very good kind of excellent uh, kappa values for inter-rater reliability. And intra-rater reliability was even a little higher actually for the three components. So the bottom line is, you know, these are pretty easily remembered uh, criteria if you use it uh, uh, routinely. And um, uh, but obviously the key is that uh, I think you have to start looking at the, the, the um, supine x-ray. I highly recommend that as a universal flexibility film. There's no effort involved. There's no uh, uh, subjectivity at all. You just have the patient lay down comfortably, get an x-ray and see how the curves uh, decrease um, just by taking gravity off the spine. It also correlates a little more closely to how the patient's going to look prone on the OR table. So it, it's a nice reference for that. And uh, I've been getting supine x-rays on all my patients for over 20 years, but we really uh, uh, honestly don't get side bending measurements anymore. I can get all the information I need to from the supine, single supine x-ray without patient effort and without any uh, subjectivity or, or um, uh, other problems when we start asking patients to bend or twist or do traction, things like that, that are much uh, less reliable in, in the data. So again, this new triad system of uh, adult idiopathic scoliosis, uh, has three components. Again, this curve type of one through six, the lumbosacral modifier, either non-structural or structural, and the global balance modifier. Again, one of four types, balanced, sagittally imbalanced, coronal imbalanced, or combined coronal and sagittal imbalance for the complete curve classifications you see. All right, so let's uh, uh, go through a few cases now to kind of highlight how this, how we use the system, how it benefits, and, and some issues with it. I'll show one or two cases where you know it doesn't work out perfectly, and, and, I'll, and I'll, we'll talk about that because obviously, you know, no, no classification system is perfect. And uh, but I'll tell you, I think why I think this system at least helps me kind of organize my thoughts on how to approach these patients, and uh, I think will help uh, give a little more uniform assessment and hopefully treatment of these kind of patients. So here's a 44 year old female. She presents with mid lumbar back pain in these X-rays. These are standing x-rays, obviously, 35 degree main thoracic curve or major curves or lumbar, thoracal lumbar curve is 52 degrees and her L4 to 6 and lumbar sacral curve is 22 degrees. Uh, you see she's got pretty reasonable sagittal profile uh, parameters. She's a little bit hypokyphotic, uh, but uh, uh, overall a reasonable regional and global alignment in the sagittal plane. So here's her supine image. So we just lay her down. The thoracic curve is 27 degrees. The major curve is 41 degrees. That's irrelevant. That's the major curve. That's, that's going to be treated no matter what. Uh, and the uh, L4 to sacrum lumbar sacral curve is 12 degrees. So the bottom line is uh, uh, that uh, the only major curve is the thoracal lumbar curve. Uh, the lumbar sacral modifier is non-structural at 12 degrees. And so the classification is five non-structural balanced. So for a five non-structural balance, that is really uh, uh, pushing us to recommend just selective treatment of the thoracal lumbar curve. 
again, you can do it however you want. You can do it anterior, or posterior, it doesn't matter, but it's really promoting trying to do a very short fusion on this patient that has non-structural curves above and below the major focal lumbar curve. And so that's what I do. I do a T11 to L3 posterior fusion. Uh, you see, I get L3 fairly well aligned on the sacrum. Uh, and her overall balance is still fairly good. A little bit of residual thoracic curve, but the, her shoulders are balanced and sagittal plane really don't change very much because she is in good uh, regional alignment. And so we did a very short fusion on her uh, as based uh, as a classification predicted. So a little more large uh, deformity that we uh, sometimes see is a 27 year old presents with this very large thoracic uh, deformity, a, a sp uh, spine and chest wall deformity with a bit of thoracic hyperkyphosis. So the main curve you see is 146 degrees. So again, it's supine imaging. You lower the patient, uh, lay the patient down. The main thoracic curve uh, just goes to 132 degrees, just showing the stiffness, obviously. The proximal thoracic curve above is 40 degrees, so that's structural. It's greater than 35. And the lumbar curve below is uh, non-structural. And the lumbosacral uh, curve is 16 degrees, non-structural, uh, with thoracic hyperkyphosis. So uh, uh, what's the classification? Is two non-structural balanced on this. So it's a double thoracic curve, uh, non-structural level cycle region and balanced modifier. So it's really stressing that we should treat this just like we would a uh, uh, adolescent patient. So here we do a T2 to L3, the last touch vertebra is L3. So we stop at L3, we do a single level VCR for a correction here and we get very nice correction of this uh, patient uh, radiographically. And as you'll see clinically here without a thoracoplasty, just uh, from the single level VCR very nice trunk realignment on this uh, on this patient. So uh, give me one second. Uh, my wife has called me three times in the last few minutes. I'm not, I'm not sure what uh, there's an issue or not. So let's see if she left me a voice message. I apologize. She hasn't. So let me, let me text her real quick to make sure she knows I'm doing a call. I'm, I'm sorry, I apologize, but my wife never calls me. So we're not, she's, she's away from home right now. So I wanna make sure she's okay. I'm giving a, Zoom talk. Talk is uh, okay. Sorry about that. All right. So how about this curve? Another uh, 28 year old with a little larger deformity, um, uh, 60 degree thoracic, 80 degree lumbar, 18 degree lumbar circle curve on standing images. You see the thoracic lumbar kyphosis on the sagittal as well. So again, the supine image is the key thing to look at. So again, a very rigid main thoracic curve, uh, 57 degrees. So that's obviously a structural main thoracic curve. Lumbosacral curve is only 12 degrees. So that's non-structural uh, lumbosacral modifier. Obviously we have a thoracal lumbar kyphosis. So no matter what the thoracic curve side bends, we still have a structural thoracic curve because of the thoracal, thoracal lumbar kyphosis that's gonna preclude isolated treatment of the thoracal lumbar spine. So uh, this classifies as a six type six non-structural balance deformity. So type six is uh, got a double major curve where the major curve is the lumbar curve, but the thoracic curve is also structural. So we're gonna treat this again, uh, similar to we treat an adolescent, uh, treating both thoracic and lumbar curves. Uh, uh, here we do a T4 to L4 fusion, a uh, very nice realignment in the coronal plane. Where you see we uh, nicely correct the thoracal lumbar kyphosis as well, radiographically. So good balance here at uh, two years post-operative. On the radiographs, you see we create a little bit more thoracic kyphosis for better pulmonary function. The, the thoracic spine was lordotic uh, in the pre-op imaging. And you see the result in clinical improvement as well from, uh, from this procedure. A lot of the correction coming from the correction of thoracal lumbar kyphosis which really produces the very large thoracal lumbar prominence in these patients. Um, so she's done very well uh, with this procedure. So here's a little more complicated case for uh, stenosis and arthritis starts uh, getting into uh, the, the mix. So there's a 52 year old that presents with low back pain and significant left leg pain. And I can tell you now that's surprising the left leg pain is coming from L45 uh, lateral recess uh, foraminal stenosis. So here's his image of standing 32 degree thoracic curve, 47 degree lumbar curve, 18 degree lumbar sacral curve with a reasonable sagittal mal uh, alignment, of, a touch of thoracic lumbar kyphosis, but um, uh, uh, overall, fairly reasonable sagittal alignment. He's had previous cervical uh, surgery. So in supine imaging, the thoracic curve is 22 degrees. So that's non-structural. And the major curve uh, is only 28 degrees. So again, that's so still the curve that's going to be treated. Uh, but the lumbosacral curve is non-structural at 14 degrees. So when we look at the classification, it's type 5 non-structural balanced. So as we've already seen, that's really pointing us to maybe just treating the thoracal lumbar curve alone and leaving the rest of the spine 
uh, uh, um, uh, without fusion. But the problem here, obviously, is that he's got significant stenosis at L3, 4, and 4, 5. So we can't leave the lumbosacral curve alone, right? So now here's where the classification, again, without MRI imaging uh, is, is problematic, right? It doesn't really tell us that the lumbosacral curve is, uh, is um, uh, significantly structural. And so we have to include that in our construct. So here we do obviously decompressions of a stenosis, uh, two level T lift L4551 to horizontalize L4 to sacrum and uh, uh, do a T10 to sacrum construct on him for correction of his curve as well. So again, not, uh, not exactly what the classification would predict. And that's because you know, on, on patients as they get older, we really need MRI imaging to help sort out the, some of the um, issues in the lumbar and lumbosacral region. And you know, we're probably going to add uh, uh, as a third modifier of uh, the MRI scans. I didn't want to do that initially because I was concerned it would be too much for surgeons and the reliability wouldn't be as good. But I can tell you that at some point, we're going to have to have a, you know, some type of MRI imaging in, in an adult classification system to help us to help guide our treatment, especially uh, as patients get older, right? That's a, that's a logical uh, conclusion. And here's another example. So let's take the 69-year-old patient now who has uh, really presents with truncal collapse, uh, some right-sided uh, buttock uh, pain from her uh, lumbosacral fractional curve, and, a, and basically a collapsing uh, thoracic and thoracic lumbar kyphosis as well. So again, just an overall kind of osteopenic uh, spine collapse over time with a long-standing thoracic lumbar idiopathic curve. So her supine imaging on the frontal plane shows residual 41-degree thoracic curve, so that's structural. And the lumbosacral L4 to sacrum curve is 26 degrees, so that's also structural. So her major curve obviously is in the thoracic lumbar spine, and she's also sagittally imbalanced. Uh, you see 6.2 centimeters in her C7 SVA. So her classification is type six structural sagittally imbalanced. So this is going to imply we're going to do a much bigger operation on this lady. Obviously, we've got to do the whole spine. We have to get her rebalanced in the sagittal plane. Obviously, we have to uh, fix her to the sacrum and pelvis, and uh, so a much much bigger operation than what we've seen. So here's a T2 to sacrum posterior procedure. You see uh, three level inner bodies, uh, T lifts, uh, three, four, four, five, five, one to try and horizontalize L3. You see some posterior osteotomies, the, the lower thoracic thoracic lumbar region to correct the kyphosis. And here she has one year post op with very nice uh, realignment in the coronal and sagittal planes. Um, uh, no evidence of PJK so far, fairly good neck alignment uh, as well. Here's her uh, global images. So uh, we, we have uh, total body images on all our patients. I won't show all of them, but obviously all our patients get total body imaging. We see the uh, nice realignment and, and corresponding changes you see in the neck above the, the pelvis, hips below and everything. When you really look carefully, there's, it's amazing the changes that we see in all the unfused areas of the body, not just the spine, but even the lower extremities that we, as we published in these patients when we realign the spine. It's, it's quite remarkable actually. Uh, here's her photos. And one thing I wanna highlight on her that uh, always is a nice uh, thing to look at is, you know, all our patients obviously get pre and post-op uh, uh, reported outcomes of the SRS and ODI. And here's her one-year post-op scores. Uh, you see that is actually true. Her ODI is zero. It started out at 30. So, uh, you know, you can do total spine reconstructions like this and have patients be completely asymptomatic with absolutely no pain. You see her SRS domain is five. So she has absolutely no pain and is functioning quite well. And they're very pleased with the results of this total spine reconstruction, even at age 69, 70. Um, uh, patients can do quite well with these. So here's another case, a 51-year-old female uh, presents with low back pain and rib on pelvis deformity. Uh, you see she has upright 24-degree proximal thoracic, 57-degree main thoracic, 79-degree lumbar, and a 34-degree lumbosacral curve. You know, all three, all four is almost touching the ilium, so very, very uh, angled lumbosacral region. You see your sagittal plane, although globally aligned, is uh, regionally very malaligned. You see she has thoracic lordosis of minus 12 degrees, a severe thoracic lumbar kyphosis of 58 degrees, and then lumbar hyperlordosis of 21 degrees um, uh, with a very large PI of 92 degrees and a pelvic uh, tilt of 41 degrees. So she's got a lot of compensation going on here. Uh, and without her thoracic lordosis, she'd, be ha she'd have a much forward positive sagittal balance, right? She's kind of compensated long-term by severe thoracic lordosis. Uh, which is not ideal because that obviously takes away pulmonary function as well. So laying her down, you see in the frontal plane, her thoracic curves goes to 38 degrees. So that's structural, not surprisingly. And her lumbosacral fractional curve is still 28 degrees from L4 to sacrum. So that's also structural as well. So her classification then is six structural balanced. And um, so how we're going to treat her again, here's where, you know, we kind of 
uh, there's some um, uh, uh, basis here on how healthy she is, you know, what her goals are, what our goals are. This is otherwise a very healthy lady. And I'm going to be pretty aggressive with this lady, not only to correct her deformity, because uh, she really um, uh, has a lot of truncal deformity complaints and uh, also a, a suboptimal PFTs because of her thoracic lordosis. So I'm going to basically do a fairly aggressive procedure here. I do a unilateral um, L2 PSO. So just on the convexity, I take the pedicle out just on the convexity only, not, not the concavity. Um, and basically do posture column osteotomies and two level T lifts as you see. Uh, and also do some posture osteotomies in the thoracic region to create thoracic kyphosis. So you see in the coronal plane, we've got her nicely realigned, got her ribs off her pelvis, got her lumbar sickle region nicely aligned. But in the sagittal plane, you see we've created uh, almost 50, over 50 degrees of thoracic kyphosis. We've taken out completely her thoracal lumbar kyphosis with the uh, unilateral PSO, and we reestablished much more lumbar lordosis in a very symmetric, harmonious way in the mid and lower lumbar spine through the inner body fusion. So again, a more aggressive approach, but for a healthy 50-year-old, uh, you know, we think this is going to make a better result long-term. You see the um, Obviously, the improvement of her neck already. She's actually has more cervical lordosis here. I think this is uh, six months post op X-rays, um, and you see her global film again. You can see how her uh, her skull and neck position is all is already better uh, following the, the thoracic realignment and lumbar realignment. So you'll really study these images uh, again, as I said, not only to optimize the instrumented part of the spine, but really look at what the spontaneous correction is of the uninstrumented spine and pelvis and lower extremities. And we see very favorable results. We think this is going to be important long-term in these patients. Obviously, we have to have data to prove that, but we're very optimistic that's going to be important in these patients that are three-dimensionally malaligned in, in various regions of their spine. There's her photos at uh, I think six months post-op. Last case, a 69-year-old female, uh, leg pain, poor posture, uh, uh, just obviously uh, very uh, severe curvatures with chronic degeneration, a lot of degenerative changes. You see her cob measurements on the uh, upright film on the left, sagittal plane, you see she has a straight spine with marked uh, uh, PIL mismatch, severe sagittal imbalance, uh, posture over uh, almost 15 centimeters, also coronal imbalance of four centimeters as well, 4.2 centimeters. You see her uh, coronal supine imaging shows structural curves everywhere. Proximal thoracic, thoracic and lumbar sacral spine is also structural. So basically everything from T2 to sacrum is structural in this lady uh, with uh, a classification of type four, triple major, structural combined and balanced uh, posture. So this lady again is gonna need a, a significant reconstruction. We need to get her realigned in the coronal and sagittal planes. We need to relieve her stenosis in the lumbar sacral region. And obviously we need to uh, somehow avoid PJK in her with her osteoporosis. So here's her T3 to sacrum procedure. Um, we did, I think, a very nice job in the coronal plane. Uh, reasonable job in the sagittal plane, although she already has a little bit of uh, PJK starting. Um, I think she's two years post-op now on these x-rays and uh, uh, starting to notice her skull a little bit forward. So she's probably going to head to a revision at some point. But uh, again, uh, just showing, highlighting how the classification kind of correlates with how we're going to treat this kind of a patient where, uh, uh, where obviously balance is the key, coronal and sagittal we're balancing is the key to this procedure, uh, as well as uh, doing it as safely as possible. Here's her global films at uh, two years post-op. Photos. All right, so I th thank you for allowing me to present this uh, new radiographic classification system. Uh, again, it's modeled after the well-accepted and long-standing AIS classification system. This has three components. Again, the curve type, uh, one of six curve types. So the lumbar sickle modifier, the non-structural structural, and the global balance modifier, either being balanced, sagittally balanced, coronally balanced, or combined and balanced. Uh, you know, we have shown in excellent inter and inter observer reliability and post your treatment options, obviously, uh, you know, the key here is develop a system that uh, can allow classification to organize and compare uh, similar types of curves. And obviously there's many different ways to treat these patients as we all know. Um, uh, so the next thing is that if we have a system we all can agree to, then we can classify these and we can then compare treatments just like we do in AIS to figure out what the best way is to treat a certain patient. And obviously there, uh, you know, there may be uh, several different ways to come up with a good result, but uh, unless we can organize and compare apples to apples in the classification, then it's hard to compare things. So that's one of the goals of, of this system. So happy to answer any questions you have. And uh, I think actually just kind of use a little less my time than I expected, but uh, uh, please uh, critiques, questions. Uh, uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, eu deixo agora então para você, Delfino, para você organizar as perguntas, o 
debate, de uma forma geral, você podia comentar? Ok, Pimenta, obrigado, obrigado. Larry, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, really nice presentation, nice treatment, as always. Huh? Um, why uh, you you mentioned that you do not consider anymore the side banking uh, X-ray? Can you tell us uh, what's the reason? I, I yeah. don't know if you you have a bum on that, but just just to, to explain to the yeah, I think. Um, So my goal is, uh, you know, is really to try to make classification um, as um, uh, objective as possible. And one of the issues we have with the AIS system, and which also is a problem in, in, in adults as well, is that when you ask a patient to side bend, there's a lot of subjectivity. You know, how far do they bend? Is it a maximal bend, sub, a submaximal bend? Um, uh, 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 how much effort do they put into it? You know, do, are the technicians kind of forcing them to bend? Do you do it upright? Do you do it uh, laying down? Uh, you know, all those things create variability. And so um, the nice thing about a single supine image, there's no variability. Whether you do it in Brazil or United States or in, uh, China, uh, you lay someone down, gravity is the same. You're going to get the same diminution of curves reproducibly in that patient, no matter where they are in the world. So if you have an 80 degree thoracic curve that you lay the patient down and that goes to 60 degrees, uh, 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 wherever, wherever that patient's being treated, that's the same curve, that's the same flexibility. If you have an 80 degree curve and it side bends in, in one center to 60 degrees, but it side bends in another center to 40 degrees, you know, there, that, that, that's too much variability. Wait, is that curve really flexible in one center or not the other? Or is just the, the technicians are better at getting an optimal bend, right? And then, then you throw in fulcrum bends or you throw in traction, other ways people look at, uh, uh, at um, flexibility and it really becomes much, gives much more variability. So the key here is the pine image is not maximum flexibility, but it's uniform and reproducible flexibility. And to me, that's more critical. Um, also, I can tell you that I, I've gotten used to in both my pediatric and adult deformity patients. Uh, when I study, you know, right before I go in the OR, the last thing I do is I look at the AP upright and the AP supine Uh, the uh, upright lateral and the supine lateral, those four images. And I, I, I get a feel for, again, what's happened to the spine when gravity is not on the spine. And when I expose the spine, it's going to look very close to that. It's actually going to look even a little better, right? A little more relaxed because now the patient's under anesthesia. There's some muscle relaxing on board. You've taken the muscles off. But it looks much closer to the supine image and it does any side bending. And as, as far as looking at balance and, and, uh, and uh, rebalancing, uh, my mind thinks you know, better when I'm looking at one image like this, not when I'm looking at patients bending. You know, patients don't bend for a living as far as keeping them balanced or getting them optimal curve correction. So I just got in the habit. And I, I must admit that Keith Bridwell is the one who really kind of taught me this you know, 30 years ago to start thinking about looking at a, a supine image as far as uh, uh, um, uh, not only flexibility, but just overall alignment. And so I'll give him credit. Uh, but I really, really preach that as, a, as to me, that should be the main flexibility film. And I, again, it was easier in adults because, you know, adults are often stiffer and you don't really see much on the supine image or the, uh, you know, it, it doesn't really help me much. And, and so I just switched uh, all my patients. Uh, you know, I, Uh, even even my children, pediatric patients now, I really rarely get side benders because it doesn't show me very much. Uh, uh, you know, if I really want to show maximum correction, I'll go to push prone or I'll do a maximum traction X-ray. You know, to to see maximum correction, I won't do side benders anymore. But uh, that's this personal preference. You know, I think uh, a lot of surgeons once they start using the supine image, they they do see the benefits. So I, I think I have a lot of converts, at least in the United States. Um, and, I, and I guarantee if you start getting that uh, and then start looking at it, uh, I, I think you'll, you'll find it useful no matter what kind of surgery you're doing. Uh, and you can, you know, what, how you approach deformity, whether you do anteriors, posteriors combined, it doesn't matter. It just it gives you a better assessment of how that patient kind of lines up when, when they're laying down. And, um, and, I, and I think it, it, it's, very help, it's been very helpful to my career, honestly. That's fine. Another question, Larry. Uh, when we talk about the adolescent scoliosis, uh, is this a, a diagnosis? And then we can do a, class, a classification. Huh? But when we do with adults, there is a, a range of etiologies. Right. How? But, but do you think that we could uh, uh, apply uh, like a or add uh, the etiology or even the A at this classification? What do you think? Yeah. So that's you know obviously 
just to reemphasize, this is a very specific diagnosis I'm talking about, right? Adult idiopathic sclerosis, which, you know, for me, is actually a big part of my practice, but for many adult surgeons, it's a small part of their practice, right? So I must admit that I've been part of an effort with AO Spine. We, uh, there's a knowledge deformity group of AO Spine that I was chairman of, and now I'm just a member of. But uh, uh, we've spent the last two, three years coming up with a comprehensive classification system of adult spine deformity patients. It's just about ready to be submitted for publication. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and so that basically has four categories of classification. One of them is etiology, actually. So we do look at etiology of the, of the, of the adult deformity, but it's, it's all encompassing. It includes all adult deformities. Um, uh, so the, the four categories are including um, demographics. You know, we look at age, sex, frailty, things like that are, are in there. Um, then the radiographic uh, 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 parameters are in there as well, coronal and sagittal, as well as, uh, uh, and then we have a neurologic component. So neurologic um, uh, 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 symptoms and or MRI findings is also part of the classification. So a much more comprehensive system, which is really needed, obviously, for adults, as I kind of showed by that one case where the classification recommended short treatment. And obviously we had to treat the stenosis and the, and the whole curvature. So I think that's gonna be much more useful. It's obviously much more complicated. So the, que the question is, you know, I think one of the reasons why the AIS system became so well accepted so quickly and it still has stood the test of time is it's pretty simple, right? Pretty straightforward, it's modular, it's pretty easy to understand and use. You know, classification systems that get too complex, they, they don't get utilized on a day-to-day on -day basis, right? They become research tools. So uh, that's why I wanted to start out with this ADIS system being very simple. Uh, you know, it's not complete, and I'm the first one to admit there's there's some uh, faults with it, but I think it's it starts out simple, and we can always add on to it, and we will add on to it to make it more detailed and more comprehensive. But I was concerned if we started out too comprehensive that people you know would would not want to use it; it'd be too too encumbering, right? Uh, versus the AO system that we're coming out with is going to be a very, it's almost like a, a categoriz categorization, not, not even a, a classification. It's just a kind of a profile. I say profiling. That's the word we use, actually. It's a, it's a patient profile because that's really what you need, right? When you're assessing an adult deformity patient, you need really their whole profile. We need their medical history, their comorbidities, their symptoms, their radiographs, their etiology, uh, their neurologic function, right? You need all this to really properly diagnose and treat an adult spine deformity patient. So it's much more complicated than AIS, right? So, um, so uh, th with that acknowledgement, I think, you know, the kind of parallel efforts, the AO system is going to be much more comprehensive. This is much more simpler, but I think, uh, you know, hopefully both may have, a, um, uh, I think, uh, opportunities to, to help uh, surgeons assess their patients. Good. I think that uh, Dr. Dennis Sakai has a question. Please, Dennis, can you, can you make the question? Hi, Dr. Lenke, how are you? Good, Dennis, how are you? Thank you for the, uh, for the talk. So uh, actually in one of, of your cases, uh, you showed that uh, in the supine x-ray, there was an increase in the cup angle. And uh, what's, what's your thought on that? <laughs> Would that represent the, any reciprocal change mechanism in the standing position, position or? Yeah, it might be a, a that and maybe a little bit measurement error. You know, obviously if the curves are really close, sometimes there's a slight measurement error. Um, that's that's the you know, uh, and who, who's measuring them? But uh, you know, normally there won't be a huge difference. I think uh, occasionally we see a you know one or two degree difference uh, that may be uh, 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 within measurement error. But you know, it's it's pretty rare for a supine X-ray to show more than a five or ten degree larger curve than upright. If that's the case, then then I think you need to probably should remeasure the curve. Um, that's, that's pretty unusual. Almost always the curves the same or slightly less or a lot less. I mean, you know, obviously in young adults, sometimes we see 30, 40% uh, diminution of the, of the curve uh, when, when patients take gravity off the spine. And then obviously in adolescence, you know, I do supine imaging on my adolescents. Sometimes we'll see 60, 70% uh, reduction in curve magnitude when they go supine. So it just depends obviously on the age of the patient, the size of the curve, the stiffness and things like that, uh, depending on how much uh, uh, diminution we see. But obviously you'll see net less diminution than a side bending. But again, to me, it's more important to see the percent diminution than the actual amount of, of uh, correction because that, that percent correction is really what I'm more interested in because that leads to obviously percent flexibility. Um, and, uh, and, and then you can categorize curves as either, you know, stiff um, or, or more flexible. Pimenta, would you like to make some comments? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to know, uh, Larry, uh, is it a role for EOs? 
Well, you know, I, I've been spoiled. I, we were one of the first centers in the, the America to have you. I've had EOS for over 18 years now. So um, I can tell you that in studying all of my deformity patients pre and post-op with complete body images, I've learned a, a lot. I've learned a lot about uh, their, their preoperative condition, and I've learned a lot about what my surgery has done to their overall, not only regional alignment, but their overall global alignment, and especially to the unfused areas I mentioned. It's truly remarkable what happens. And amazingly, often the compensation, spontaneous compensation happens immediately. You know, four days post-op after a T2 to sacrum, when we get a post-op x-ray, we can see 30 degree change in cervical lordosis. And we've done a nice job of recreating more harmonious and normalized thoracic kyphosis and lumbar lordosis. We see immediately a change even in, even in patients in their 50s and 60s and 70s. It's just shocking. I've got a whole talk on that actually, Louise, but uh, it's truly remarkable. Now, you know, we don't always see uh, immediate compensation, but I'm, I'm just shocked how, how much, how often we do see it and how much we're learning by it. So we're, you know, we're doing a lot of research on it now to kind of correlate that because I think it does have long-term implications on kind of what kind of the type of surgery we should do. And, and hopefully we can help solve PJK and other issues by looking at the, at the whole body response to these, to these type of deformity surgeries. It's truly remarkable. Larry, in, in the last uh, classification of SRS, there was a category uh, that suggested to consider the sagittal deformity. Right. What why you, uh, you decided not to include a pure sagittal deformity in the classification? Yeah, well, and we, you know, we do have sagittal imbalance, which is obviously a very crude thing. The reason being is that um, uh, uh, two reasons. Number one, obviously, I think you know the, the last ten years has been the age of sagittal plane emphasis in adult deformity, and and rightly so, right? I mean, you know, whether you use the PILL mismatch or Rousselli's classification. Uh, you know, obviously there's been a lot of emphasis placed on the sagittal plane, which has been perfectly appropriate, but I think it's gone a bit overboard. At times people have ignored the coronal plane. They've not paid much attention to the lumbosacral fractional curve. And I, honestly, I see probably as many patients for coronal, residual coronal problems in, in adult deformities. I do sagittal problems because again, especially in patients that are treated with longer construct to the pelvis, sacrum and pelvis, if you're off a little bit in the coronal plane, Patients aren't happy. There's no, no way to compensate for that. If you're off a touch in a sagittal plane, you, you know, you can have slight knee flexion, slight hip extension, maybe slight neck extension to realign yourself and, and hit, a, hit a balance point. But there is no compensation besides wearing a shoe lift or being off balance in the coronal plane. So I think one of my purposes here is to really realize that, you know, if you're going to treat adult deformity, you have to pay a lot of attention to the coronal plane. And I honestly, in, in the OR, uh, when I get my final films, you know, when the patient's still uh, um, uh, open and, and I can adjust things, I, I pay as much attention looking at the coronal plane alignment as I do the sagittal plane alignment, because honestly, I've had more trouble with that because you, you have to be perfect in the coronal plane. Otherwise, patients are not very happy. Um, so that, 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 maybe that's a long answer, but that's why I think, uh, you know, we, we need to kind of come back and revisit the coronal plane to make sure that we understand we can't ignore that. Obviously, sagittal plane, you know, given a choice, Sagittal plane does overrule coronal plane, but we can't ignore coronal plane uh, alignment, right? That, that's, that's the point. That's true, that's true. Uh, I, I agree with you, we missed it a little bit the, the coronal right. plane. I, I call it the stepchild of, of deformity surgery, right? Dr. Fernando Marcelino has a question, please. Uh, Dr. Link, hi. Hello. Hi. Um, I've been in New York in 2018, and I see you doing some uh, to control the coronal imbalance, you, you used to put um, unscrew in the crystallic uh, uh, and do extraction. Right. You the kickstand, I call it the kickstand rod. Yeah, it, 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 you just let the rod there, you took out after the, the, the total instrumentation. What do you do? What do you... Yeah, so, um, so what he's referring to is for patients who have marked coronal imbalance, uh, uh, um, uh, usually more than six or eight centimeters that the, is very difficult to correct with conventional techniques. Um, on the concavity of the curve, um, I will put, basically put a second iliac femur lateral and attach it to a rod and, and basically distract off the rod to push the spine over in a coronal plane. Actually, next Wednesday night, I'll put a plug in. It's uh, at 7 p.m. Eastern time. 
I'm giving a lecture on this. It's called The Kickstand Technique for Coronal Balance, uh, uh, a, a talk sponsored by Broadwater. Uh, so there's going to be a large webinar. Um, that's, uh, I think, uh, hopefully some of you got emails about that. I know that it got mailed to over 8,000 surgeons around the world, but I have a whole hour talk just on this technique. But it's a wonderful technique. We just recently published it. I've been using it for 20 years, but we just published it. But it's a wonderful technique of uh, basically pushing over the trunk in the coronal plane. And uh, the bottom line is, uh, in answer to your question, I actually lead the rod in. Uh, I, and I've never had to replace the rod. I've never had one of those rods break. It's been again over 20 years since I've been using that technique. You know, I've probably had 50 to 60 patients. I don't have thousands of patients I've used it on, but at least 50 or 60. And honestly, I, I use it on as another support rod because obviously the patient always wants to go back to the original deformity. So I've just left it in. But I'm not seeing long-term rod breakages or iliac crest pain or other problems with it. So surprisingly, because um, I'm not doing SI joint fusions uh, with this. Uh, uh, but obviously, uh, but I've, I've been, I've not seen any long-term complications. So it's a very nice technique. I can tell you that if you get stuck in the OR, the nice thing is you can either plan to do it initially, or you can add it on even at the end of surgery. So in other words, I've gotten an x-ray in the OR when I, my, all my corrections done and the patient's off balance. So I look at the pelvis and the spine is like this. I, and I'm, you know, maybe I do some compression distractions. I do contouring and I'm still off like this. So basically what I'll do is I'll put another, I'll dissect, put another iliac screw on this side, put another rod in and push the patient over like this. And you can do that even with all your instrumentation. And all you need to do is all set plugs below where you have the connector for the rod in that you're going to extract off. You just have to loosen them. Uh, and then you can even keep the contralateral set plugs tight because it's really a ipsilateral hemipelvis distraction that you're doing. And you distract on the rod. Uh, uh, and then tighten it down and you'll see that basically the, the, the pelvis will level out and the spine will be more balanced. And you don't, and you don't lose, the key is here, you don't create lumbar kyphosis or you don't take away lumbar lordosis because you have the other side locked down. So the sagittal plane doesn't change. It's purely a coronal plane, a translational maneuver. And it's, um, it's quite simple and it, it work, I can tell you uh, it works amazingly well. So um, uh, it, I, we just had a recent publication on it. You can look up, uh, and then uh, if you want, if you can join this webinar next week, I'm going to show six or seven cases of how it's helped me get out of trouble, either pre-op or you know during surgery or when I wouldn't, didn't expect to have coronal imbalance. Uh, uh, you can add it on any time. It's very helpful. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Next question. I think you, Dr. Bruno would like to make the, the question. No. Dr. Paulo, have a question. May I, may I ask you, Dr. Link? Yes. Yes. Um, Dr. Dr. Link, uh, the, the rationale to use to go to the iliac to use the uh, iliac screws is to protect the S S1 screws. Uh, so do you think that when you use uh, A-leaf, one, two, or three A-leaf, uh, it can be possible to uh, not, not go into the iliac, or mm -hmm. uh, there is any possibility to protect more the the Irium uh, screws with the use of a leaf. Sure. Great question. I think um, uh, you know certainly. I think um, uh, using uh, iliac or SCI, I'm technically using S two AI screws, and there's a difference there because you know when we change from iliac to S two AI screws, our our rate of any complications or issues with the pelvic fixation drops significantly. Uh, in nine years now, I've only had to take out S two AI screws in two patients. Uh, uh, so it's, it's very well tolerated, but back to your question, I think certainly that's very possible that, uh, if you do a very good a lift structural a lift and have excellent posterior S one tricortical screws, uh, that maybe you don't need to use iliac fixation in some patients. I would venture to say though, if you're doing very long constructs, you know, T4 to sacrum, you know, uh, besides protecting the S1 screw, I can tell you that I have many patients have showed up with sacral fractures and things like that. So, you know, it, it's, uh, there's so much force on the S1 level um, with a long construct that I, I personally sleep so much better having additional iliac fixation. And I can tell you that, especially S2AI screws, it's extremely well tolerated. And I think the reason why is when we did iliac screws or we do iliac screws, you, you know, you bite, you kind of cover the SI joint with a connector. And so you really lock down motion of the SI joint. But with the S2AI screw, you pierce the SI joint. And so the SI joint can still move. And so patients can still have some pelvic waddle. 
So they, it's much better tolerated. I've, I've, been, I've been really surprised. And I give credit to Cal Quebec and Sp Paul Sponsel, or those, at least in the U, those are the U.S. surgeons who uh, you know, taught us about this technique, but I'll give them credit. I, it's made a big difference in my uh, uh, adult patients, especially having any type of posterior pelvic pain or restriction of motion long-term. It's, it's extremely well tolerated. And again, uh, uh, for me, I mean, uh, you know, we just don't see sacral fractures or S1 screw issues, and we have a higher L5 S1 sort of uh, a fusion rate as well. Now, obviously, you know, giving, uh, granted, it is much harder to get a fusion with the T-lift and A-lift. So if you're doing good A-lift work, you, what, you do have a distinct advantage. I will give you that for sure. But since I do everything posterior, you know, I've got to do everything I can to get these patients healed, right, and to protect their S1 screws. So for me, it's using bilateral S2AI screws is what I've done now for eight or nine years uh, now running. So, but it's a very good question. Thank you. Any other question? Someone asked about uh, when do I need to use two more than two rods? You want me to talk about that real briefly? Yes. So you saw some of my constructs. So probably up until uh, 10 years ago, uh, you know, uh, on any long construct to the sacrum of pelvis, I only used two rods. Uh, as you know, though, we all started using more rods around PSOs or VCRs because we had early rod failure, right? After we you know, cut the spine in half with a three column osteotomy, we realized we needed more support before, uh, to win the race against perfusion versus instrumentation failure. And what I found out over time that I kind of extrapolated the data we had from using uh, three or four rods uh, over three column osteotomy sites to using them at, at the bottom of the constructs. Cause that's typically where if we have rod failure, pseudarthrosis, that's still where we're seeing it. I can't remember the last time I had a thoracic pseudarthrosis in a long construct. We only see pseudarthrosis and rod failure at the bottom of constructs. Why? Because the forces are six, seven times your body weight. That's where all the forces are. So kind of like a biomechanical engineering building, you know, we, we think we need more support at the bottom than we need at the top. So I started going, instead of using two rods, using three rods, and then basically migrated using four rods and only on every long construct going from the upper thoracic spine to the sacrum and ilium. So I basically start out with two rods on top and I go to three rods and then to four, and then the four rods cover basically from L1 to sacrum. And uh, again, nothing, nothing's gonna work forever, but I can tell you that it, I've got probably uh, three to four year experience of doing four rod constructs. And so far I've not had to revise one of them. I have several patients that have one or two rods broken. And so I'm sure that some of them are, you know, either are or developing a pseudarthrosis. But the nice thing about using four rods also, and I, um, is that uh, I have one patient that uh, broke one rod uh, at about one and a half years post-op, broke a second rod uh, two and a half years post-op, did not lose alignment, uh, became pain-free, but I got a CT scan and I saw pseudarthrosis. So I fixed her. Um, uh, basically, I had my uh, one of my partners do a do a um, uh, uh, olefoner at L34 was her pseudo level. So we did basically a less invasive anterior fusion procedure on her without having to touch her posteriorly because she she still had two rods intact and she had not lost alignment. So it's kind of an early warning, in other words, that you you know that you even if you do have pseudarthrosis, you're going to be warned about it that maybe you can do something before they present with catastrophic failure or marked malalignment. So if, um, you know that's not the main reason to do it. I think the main reason to use more than two rods is that it helps support the lumbosacral region. I think it will increase our fusion rate, but it's not going to make it. 100%, uh, nothing's gonna make it 100%. But at least in those patients who aren't gonna heal, we have a little bit early warning. So we can approach them and maybe treat them before they lose um, uh, uh, alignment and then maybe treat them with less invasive procedures, right? Uh, um, uh, maybe Louise, I see you nodding. I think that that might be, may be help on some of our patients, right? Okay, any other question? Pimenta, would you like to, to close the session? Então, aqui, então, a gente vai terminando. Thank you very much, uh, Larry. It was spectacular. Uh, great to hear that you still do minimal invasive procedures. <laughs> it's all uh, in the head. It's all in the head. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, então, uh, aos colegas, eu acho que foi brilhante. Um, a gente tem que ir para casa e ler três, quatro, cinco vezes isso até sedimentar, mas eu acho que é muito importante essa, essa classificação. Um, enfim, parabéns ao, ao Rio de Janeiro pela iniciativa uma vez mais. Thank you, Larry.
Have a good night. Good evening. Pleasure. Thank York. you, Liz. Thanks for the opportunity. It's good to see you. All right. Thank you. Be, be safe, everyone. Be safe. Vamos encerrar. Obrigado a todos, tá? A gente se vê em breve. Marco, parabéns aí. Muito boa iniciativa. Parabéns. Um abraço a todos aí. Pimenta, tchau, tchau. Tchau, tchau. Boa noite.